So welcome everyone to the Meany Reese Library Conversation Series, hosted by the Graduate Center of the City of New York. We're happy to have you here today with us. Um, these conversations are typically held on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Today is a summer anomaly at 4 p.m. Um, and the series is intended to be a lively conversation between scholars, faculty, and other idea makers and thinkers. Um, it's inspired by the pioneering mathematician Mina spiegel rees She was CUNY's first Dean of Graduate Studies and also named the Graduate Center's first president. Exciting. Um, we're here today with Ben Saunders, who is an associate professor of psychology at Long Island University. Um, Co-host Kate Angel, adjunct reference librarian at the Graduate Center, and myself, Elvis Bakaitis, the interim head of reference at the Graduate Center Library. So to make this lively, um, we would strongly encourage you to drop your questions in the chat if you have them. Um, we would really love to have a lively Q&A. So anytime you have thoughts or you're, you know, just have any kind of question um, that you'd like to kind of hear played out and discussed, um, we're really happy to have that happen. Um, you can also use the raised hand feature in Zoom, which will let us know that you'd like to go live to ask your question, um, and we can kind of pivot to you in the Q&A. Um, so with that, thank you so much for joining us today. And coming up soon, let's see, we have Stina Soderling. Hmm, time has changed on this, and oh, these are still July, but um, we have some other events coming up soon that will be really excellent, and I'll drop a link in the chat in a second for more info about those. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and pivot back. Um, so Ben, if you would like to take it away with your screen sharing, I will pivot over to you for a second. If I have everyone's attention, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to thank both Elvis and Kate for inviting me to speak in the Mina Reese Conversation series. Uh, I'll be talking uh, uh, about a paper I published uh, just a few years ago on uh, New York City stop and frisk uh, policy and some of the, the um, ideological variables uh, uh, as well as prejudice that might predict support for, for such a policy. Uh, moreover, I, I plan to talk about what inspired me to conduct this research uh, uh, as well as importantly, how I use the library uh, uh, in, in both this research program and, and other research programs that uh, I'm using. And so, uh, I just want to orient you uh, uh, to kind of the, the flow of my presentation. And what you'll see is that in the upper left-hand corner, right, uh, you should see something that says an anecdote, right? Which means we're going to start with a little story, and then I'll talk about some literature. Uh, we'll delve right into the study for a little bit. Uh, uh, and then I hope to talk about both this study and, and uh, whatever other questions uh, uh, you might have for me. And so without further ado, oh, I do also want to say that I, I, um, I saw a couple of familiar faces here. So thank you, David, for attending. And I, I believe I saw my friend Rachel here, too. Uh, and it's wonderful to, uh, be, to be able to talk about my research uh, uh, among friends. And so to um, begin <laughs> with an anecdote, you see that I say, wherein I throw my father-in-law under the bus ever so gently, right? Uh, and so how exactly uh, will I throw my uh, father-in-law under the bus? Uh, well, you'll see that this uh, photo is a photo of me from nearly uh, uh, seven years ago now. Uh, and in fact, it was just a couple of days before the mayoral election in, in 2013. My hair was much shorter. As you can see, uh, uh, I was just beginning to grow what is now uh, uh, my big hair. And um, this is just the second time that I'd met my father-in-law in this picture, right? In this picture. And you could, if you know, if you can tell in this picture, uh, you know, I look maybe like a little, little nervous because, you know, meeting, meeting the person that's, that's going to be your father-in-law is always kind of a, you know, uh, a tense situation. Uh, but I want to talk specifically about the very first time uh, 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 that we met and how that conversation actually inspired this research project. Uh, and so, uh, so to, to go back to 2013, um, again, uh, I, was, I was dating my, my now wife and uh, we thought it was time to do the whole meet the parents thing. And I, I'd, uh, I'd met my now uh, mother-in-law already Right. Uh, but um, 
apparently there was kind of like a phasing in of the family. It was like the mother, you know, the, the mom first and, and, and then the dad, right? Uh, and so we go out to, um, to eat at a nice little uh, uh, seafood restaurant in Brooklyn. And uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, my, my, my in-laws, they like talking about politics, which is something that my family doesn't often do, right? Uh, and uh, this, is, this is, again, uh, noteworthy because, like I said, it was a couple of days before uh, the, the mayoral election in 2013, right? The one that elected uh, Bill de Blasio. And at that time, as, it, uh, as, you, as you may remember, stop and frisk policing uh, uh, was a major issue, right? Uh, and in particular, what research found uh, uh, is that uh, the overwhelming majority right, of people that were uh, arrested in New York City were not necessarily arrested, but stopped, questioned, and frisked, right, which often led to an arrest, right? The majority of the people that were, were stopped uh, uh, were people of color, primarily black and, and brown people. Although, right, uh, in particular, one of the offenses, right, that uh, that often led to arrest from stop questioning and frisk uh, 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 was was uh, the possession of marijuana, right? And interestingly, uh, uh, you know, there are no racial differences in the consumption of marijuana, right? And, and, and that you know, all racial and ethnic groups more or less tend to consume that illegal product, uh, you know, uh, relatively relatively evenly, right? And so it was a, it was a problem, uh, or at least some people thought it was a problem, right? That uh, that there was this discriminatory policy, right? And so uh, at this dinner, my, my, my wife brings this up and she says, I want to vote for Mayor, uh, or for now, he's mayor now, but Bill de Blasio, uh, because, um, you know, he has kind of uh, uh, stepped out against uh, uh, the stop questioning and, and, and first policy. And I remember vividly that my father-in-law in this discussion said, well, you know, it's a discriminatory policy, but it keeps the streets clean, right? I remember specifically that statement and I thought, mm, okay, I actually had a number of different reactions to that, right? So when I think of keeping the streets clean, right? Uh, uh, you know, one of the things I might think is, all right, well, well, what is clean on the streets, right? Well, trash, right? So does that mean that the people on the streets that are associated with the stop and frisk policing are trash, right? Uh, but then psychologically, remember, I am a social psychologist, right? Uh, uh, that is, that's my, my, my training. Uh, uh, and increasingly, I've been kind of shifting towards political psychology. And in that, in that training, uh, uh, there is a line of research, right? Uh, that suggests that, that, that feelings about like things like keeping the streets clean, right, uh, uh, are in fact associated with, with uh, things like prejudice uh, and with um, things like support for exclusionary uh, uh, racial practices. So in other words, what I'm saying is that at this lively discussion, uh, a light bulb went off. right? I had this idea. I said, I can study this. There's, there's something interesting here, right? Uh, that there was some contention here, there was some disagreement about, you know, uh, uh, support versus opposition for stop and frisk policing, right? Uh, and from what I had been reading in the literature, I thought that I that I had made some kind of connection, and that's what uh, uh, I intend to talk about next, because that connection, of course, is authoritarianism. Now, uh, there are a number of of, of definitions for um, authoritarianism. Right, uh, but what I would like to say is that first and foremost, uh, authoritarianism, uh, you know, as we know it today, uh, was pioneered by psychologists, right, uh, uh, and not political scientists, right. And there's actually a long line of research uh, dating back to 1950, right, on the authoritarian uh, personality. Uh, and the seminal text, of course, is a text by uh, uh, Theodore Adorno and, and, and colleagues, right? And so this authoritarianism is a generalized dislike of outgroups and minorities, right? So that's part of uh, authoritarianism. In other words, what we would say is that authoritarianism involves ethnocentrism, right? Disliking groups that are uh, uh, different from your own, right? As well as uh, an excessive and uncritical nationalism, right? So it's not just that simply, you know, authoritarians might like their country, right? But they have an uncritical, 
uh, 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 support uh, for that for that country. Now, I also want to say that this definition of authoritarianism draws largely on the work of John Duckett, uh, who has suggested that social attitudes in general are ideologically organized along a single dimension that is a direct expression of basic needs uh, and personality. In other words, right, another way to put that is that when social attitudes and views towards disadvantaged outgroups reflect enduring aspects of one's personality, right? In other words, our attitudes towards something like stop and frisk, right? Actually might reflect something about who we are, right? And our psychological needs, our attitudes, right? Uh, say something about who we are, all right? So going back to the, to the work on classic authoritarianism, right? The work of Adorno and colleagues, they suggested that um, authoritarianism boiled down to essentially nine different characteristics, right? And those characteristics were conventionalism, right? Uh, authoritarian submission, right? Which means to simply submit or agree to the, to the ideas and suggestions of a strongman leader, right? Uh, uh, as well as authoritarian aggression, right? So that means, right? Uh, that if this strong leader says, we don't like this group, right? That that sanctions, right? Uh, uh, you know, people actually harming those groups, right? Uh, there are a few other characteristics. So uh, anti-interception, not really wanting to think about things uh, uh, deeply, or at least things about oneself. Uh, superstition and stereotypy, power and toughness, destructiveness and cynicism, and projectivity and sex, right? So there were a number of things originally that were associated with authoritarianism, but to make a long story short, Right, that literature um, is to this day a hotly contested uh, 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 literature, and many of those nine characteristics uh, uh, have not been found to be associated uh, uh, with authoritarianism. Um, so, what you know, what what might we think of as uh, authoritarianism today? you know, uh, uh, maybe what we'll call 21st century uh, authoritarianism or contemporary authoritarianism, right? Well, um, uh, there seem to be at least a couple of fairly well-established dimensions, right? Uh, some that are slightly, you know, contested, but it does seem that there are a few factors that seem to be associated with authoritarianism. One of them, right, is called the right-wing uh, authoritarianism scale, right? Uh, and right-wing authoritarianism right, again refers to like three of these original nine characteristics, right, uh, that were associated with authoritarianism. So I'm talking about authoritarian aggression, right, authoritarian submission, uh, and then conventionalism, right, where conventionalism would be a rigid adherence to conventional middle-class values, right. Uh, moreover, there's a, 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 another psychological dimension that's been fairly well established over the past 20 years called social dominance orientation where social dominance orientation is a general attitudinal orientation toward intergroup relations reflecting uh, whether one generally prefers relations to be equal, right? Do you prefer equality or do you like hierarchy, right? Is part of uh, uh, social dominance orientation. Um, in other words, it's a, a preference for group-based dominance, right? Uh, as well as a, a preference for inequality. Right, so the idea is that psychologically, some people like inequality. Some people see inequality, right, uh, 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 is a, a, as what justifies their merits. In other words, right, there's inequality, there's, there's income inequality in the world, right? And like the general idea, at least among people that are higher in social dominance orientation, is that uh, that, that inequality is important because it, 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 it shows kind of, um, uh, what I want to call it, uh, you know, um, why people belong at the top, right? It show, it justifies my 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 being at the top, so to speak, right? So so um, more often than not, right, in the 21st century, right, there are a number of other measures of authoritarianism that I, I won't get into right now, uh, uh, but these are two of the psychological measures that that uh, that that tend to be used the most to study. Uh, uh, authoritarianism now. So I want to go back um, to this idea, right? I want to go back to, to the idea that I had, uh, uh, you know, when I was at lunch 
uh, with my father. Uh, I'm sorry, dinner with my, my father-in-law. He says it keeps the streets clean, right? So I started thinking about the literature, right? And, 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 and this idea, right, that these ideological variables, right, things like uh, uh, right-wing authoritarianism, right, uh, uh, and social dominance orientation, right, uh, that those variables actually strongly predict prejudice. And what research suggests is that right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation, right, account for something like 50% of the variability in prejudice, right? So they, they strongly predict prejudice, right? And so um, what I was curious about was how these variables, right, were related to support for stop and frisk policing. And there's this theoretical model, right? Uh, a theoretical model developed by uh, a researcher in Australia named John Duckett, who I referenced just a moment ago, who has what's called the dual process model, right, of, um, of prejudice, right, uh, and, and ideology, right? And so the idea behind this model, right, is that there are personality, there are, there are aspects of our personality, right, that predict these ideological variables, that predict social dominance orientation and right-wing authoritarianism, which in turn uh, uh, predict prejudice, right, which then might uh, predict support for things like um, uh, exclusionary racial policies, right? So that's this, this larger theoretical model. Uh, and, and I wasn't able to test that whole model, right? Uh, but at this time, I had a graduate student, right, who is, who is interested in right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation, right? And she was already conducting a, re or she was about to, I should say, she was about to start um, collecting data on a research project related to those variables. And I thought to myself, this is a perfect opportunity, right? For me to get some data on support for stop and frisk, right? Uh, uh, and so because of that, we made a minor alteration uh, to a study that was just about to be launched so that we could collect some data that was related to stop and frisk policing, right? And um, we, we um, collected the following variables, right? And so, this data is actually from the spring of, of 2014, right, which is uh, just a little bit after uh, Mayor de Blasio had been elected. And it's kind of in that period where stop and frisk policing uh, was on its way out, right? Because um, uh, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't remember the exact date, but I believe at some point in 2015, uh, uh, the NYPD kind of uh, banned stop and frisk policing, at least formally. Right, we know that it still happens, but at least formally, it was uh, it was banned. Right, so I collected um, uh, data on right wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation. I also used uh, a measure of prejudice called the Quick Discrimination Index. Right, and I used this measure of prejudice because uh, this data was collected at Long Island University of Brooklyn. Right, it's a university sample. Right, and Long Island University of Brooklyn. Uh, is also a very diverse sample, right? And so although, uh, uh, you know, when people think about, uh, uh, you know, support versus opposition for something like stop and frisk policing, right? Uh, we might think that there's, uh, you know, kind of like a, a racially homogenous group of, of African Americans, right? That are in strong opposition to stop and frisk policing, right? And that there might be, you know, uh, a rather racially, or, or a homogenous group of, of white Americans that, that are in support of stop and frisk, right? This, this, this might be how people think, of, think about it, right? Um, but, you know, in a diverse sample, right? Uh, and not just a, a, a diverse sample, but, but you, know, uh, you know, a sample uh, that is primarily a sample of color, at least at that point, uh, required that I, I didn't just use a typical measure of, uh, 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 you know, of prejudice, right? But I had to use something uh, that was a little bit that was a little bit broader, right? And so I, I'll try to answer if if people are curious about this measure, uh, you know, I'll talk about what some of those items are in a moment. Now, I will say that I asked a you know a number of questions about. Um, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up for a second. Um, I I did ask you know a number of questions about stop and frisk policing, however. Uh, the present analyses, you know, focus on one item. So just to review, 
uh, uh, some of the items that make up or, 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 or comprise these scales, right? I have one item from the uh, RWA scale, right? And that is, uh, and I also want to, to point out that this scale has 20 items and you take the average of all 20 of those items, right? And so this item says, it is always better to trust the judgment of the proper authorities in government and religion than to listen to the noisy rabble rousers in our society who are trying to create doubt uh, uh, in people's minds, right? Now for social dominance orientation, I have a couple of different questions here, right? Such as some groups of people are just more worthy, more worthy than others. Sometimes other groups must be kept in their place. Those are two separate items, right? On a 16 item scale where you take the average again, right? Uh, for, the quick discrimination index, right? Uh, I have a couple of items here. I really think affirmative action programs on college campuses constitute reverse discrimination. Overall, this is the second question. Overall, I think racial minorities in America complain too much about racial discrimination. And then finally, uh, for the support for stop and frisk policing item, I asked simply, do you oppose favor or neither oppose nor favor the NYPD stop and frisk policy, right? This question, uh, uh, was based on a polling item uh, uh, that I found, I believe, in, in like a Gallup poll, right? And I, I used it almost word for word. And so what did I find, right? Well, um, you know, I, I, I use what's called statistical mediation, right? Um, to test, you know, uh, uh, separately a couple of different models, right? And in this model, what I did was I once, uh, I, I also want to, to explain that, and, and it, I also want to add that, that Ellis and Kate told me that I have kind of a, a mixed audience, right? And so I won't go into this, these statistics as much as I might if it were just a faculty audience, right? Um, but in mediation, right, what you're doing is you're, you're examining causality, right? And, and, and you, you are trying to establish uh, a causal chain, right? And in this causal chain, what I did was I controlled for age and gender, Right? And that's because age and gender, right? those were things that were correlated right, with um, support for stop and frisk. Right? So I wanted to statistically make everybody in the sample equal with respect to those variables. Right? And so what I found is that RWA right, uh, was associated with increases uh, uh, in prejudice, right? which was then in turn associated with support for stop and frisk. Right? I separately, tested um uh you know kind of like the same chain with social dominance orientation right same model and, and and got generally the same results right so social dominance orientation predicts prejudice right which then in turn predicted support for stop and frisk policing right um and so um this research actually supports um, this dual process motivational model by John Duckett uh, that I talked about. But before I get there, I just want to briefly um, highlight just a little bit about what at least I think this study found, right? Uh, and that's, again, that RWA, right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation, right? Which for, for, for the sake of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to as basically contemporary authoritarianism were indirectly related to support for stop and frisk pol policing via the degree to which people were prejudiced. Okay. Uh, this may be the first psychological study to investigate support for the New York um, Police Department's controversial stop and frisk uh, policing policy. Uh, this research also reveals the role of variables like right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation in people who choose to adopt social roles that put them into positions of power over others, uh, in those who experience abuses of power, and in third-party reactions to justice and injustice. And in terms of uh, future directions, what I would like to see are further tests of the uh, dual process motivational model on police community uh, relations, for example, and these, these are things that I talked about in the research article, how might things like primary news source or fear of crime, how might, th how might, things, like, how might things like neighborhood disorder, neighborhood integration, responsiveness of authority, how might those kinds of things uh, uh, influence uh, police community relations? Uh, and last, I think that this research 
helps to further examine the influence of ideological attitudes on social policy, which is crucial for understanding the intense and often polarizing reactions of both the public and political elites in discussing politics and engaging uh, uh, in political life. And so um, in, my, in my discussion with, with Elvis and Kate, I was asked to talk about this research for, for something like 30 to 40 minutes with a, with a, with a Q&A. Um, and I, I believe it is 4.30 right now. And, and in terms of, uh, of material, that's all I have. I do see that there are a number of, uh, uh, I think, items in the chat, as well as at least one hand raised. Um, and so uh, maybe what I will do, I don't think I have any more slides. Oh, I do have one. That's right. So I did want to thank you all very much right and uh say that i am part of a, a rather uh, small but cherished research group at long island university brooklyn and that is called the pride <laughs> collaboratory where pride stands for the politics race and ideology collaboratory uh and so if you have questions about this research project or my research in general you can reach me on twitter <coughs> uh, my my twitter handle is right here uh and uh with that said i will now um stop this stop the screen share and uh open things up for for questions or uh and perhaps let um uh kate and, and elvis navigate how we how we um use our remaining time that's sure. great thank you so much ben that was a fascinating presentation and we do have about a half hour left for questions so um, I saw, let's see, there had been, um, Joel had wanted to ask a question. Um, Joel, would you like to begin the discussion period with your question? Sure. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering what you think of the notion in terms of adding the uh, independent variables into your model of a uh, focus a little bit more on class issues. Uh, it seems to me, uh, dating back to the Frankfurt School, which you mentioned in the beginning, that um, the people who tend towards uh, right-wing authoritarianism are often uh, downwardly mobile. They're squeezed by large businesses from above and, from ri and by rising demands in, this, in the United States, certainly by women and people of color from below. And because they can't explain what has happened, and this is straight out of uh, Harley Hothschild's Strangers in Their Own Land, uh, they look to some uh, father figure, some uh, authoritarian figure, who will, who will order their life and explain why they are suddenly no longer first in line in Hothschild's uh, version of things. So I'm wondering what you think of that, and whether you explored that, and how you think that might have affected uh, your, your research and conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Joel. Um, I think that's an interesting insight. Uh, you, you, you are right in that um, there, there is a line of literature on authoritarianism that is, that is focused specifically on like class, right? And, and there is this notion of what's called working class authoritarianism, right? And working class authoritarianism has been examined because it would, you know, it would seem as if the people that, that are working class um, you know, at least according to some, might be those most poised to kind of, you know, rebel against the current system, right? That, you know, uh, the, the idea is that, you know, from an economic perspective, it might be in their best interest, right, to rebel against the, the societal status quo, right? And so the question is, well, why don't uh, 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 these people rebel against the societal status quo? And that's something that um, I hadn't been able to address directly in, in that research project, but what I will say is that um, uh, although LIU Brooklyn is a private school, um, at least at that time, the, our demographics have, have, have changed a little bit. Uh, LIU is a, is a very diverse institution. It was primarily working class, right? Not only that, um, and I didn't mention this in the study, but my study, right? consisted primarily of people of color, right? And so what makes this interesting is, right, that, that uh, uh, and I don't, I don't think I, I collected data on SES in this particular sample, but what I would imagine, right, is that this is a fairly working class uh, uh, sample of color, right? And I'm still finding within that sample, right, that 
these ideological attitudes actually predict prejudice, right? Which then in turn uh, uh, predicts support for stop and frisk policing. So uh, what I'll say about uh, working class authoritarianism in general is that um, it's, it's, it's one of my core interests and, and something that um, I, I, I wish I could say something new about it now, right? Uh, I can't say anything new about it right now, but but give me you know uh, b give me like two years and, and and I hope to 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 be able to follow up with you on that. Okay. Great, thank you for your question, Joel, and for your your answer, Ben. Um, I actually have a question that I was wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the measurement tools that you use have used in your studies on social dominance and right wing authority. Um, I read your encycl the uh, description of the encyclopedia article that you wrote on Bob Altermeyer's right-wing authority scale. Um, and so I was curious to learn if measurement tools like these are ever used to evaluate applicants to law enforcement jobs. Um, and if not, do you think they'd be helpful screening tactics? Um, so that's a, an interesting question. Um, so to my knowledge, right, I, I, I think I know of, of one study that examined police officers like ideological attitudes with respect to something like right-wing authoritarianism and, you know, and social dominance orientation. And I believe that that research found, as we might expect, that police officers would be much higher on those variables than like the, the you know, um, your typical like, you know, um, student sample or nationally representative sample, right? So that's one thing that we know. But in terms of screening, right? Um, uh, no, I haven't heard of any police departments using these particular items to, to screen people. Now, what are my thoughts on that? Um, what I would say is, do, you know, do, I, do I think they could or should be used for screening? Um, well, I would say not necessarily, but that's because I have a rather radical view about, you know, the direction that the police should go and that, that direction would, would mean you know, they wouldn't need to be screened because there would probably be very, you know, fewer of them, if any of them at all, right? Uh, but that being said, to, to kind of answer your question more directly, um, it has often been uh, uh, suggested that things like implicit bias, like the IAT, right, if people are familiar with that measure, the implicit association test, right, right which is, which many people uh, uh, discuss as like a, a measure uh, of like indirect or implicit prejudice, right? Uh, uh, it has it has you know uh, come under fire uh, because it's it's not a particularly great diagnostic tool in terms of identifying someone as as, as being prejudiced, though um, it it kind of you know it 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 developed that reputation. Okay, uh, so I suppose what I would say is that in my opinion, um, if I could choose between something like the implicit uh, association test and something like RWA and SEO and measures of authoritarianism, uh, I, I would probably prefer the data on authoritarianism, right? Um, on things and not just Bob Altemeyer scale, not just RWA, not just social dominance orientation, but there are other things that are associated with uh, authoritarianism like dogmatism, right? Which is like rigidity, right? Um, um, I think there, there's uh, my, I have another line of research that was actually kind of brought on by this study and the reaction that some of my friends, uh, uh, friends of color actually had to, had to this study, right? Um, and, and that research is on something called system justification, right? Where system justification suggests that people, right? Uh, to varying degrees are motivated to defend, bolster and justify the societal status quo. Right, uh, uh, so people have a motivated, a vested interest in believing that the current system is fair. Right, so that is also something that I think contributes uh, to authoritarianism, and is something uh, uh, that that I I plan on studying for the next, you know, fifteen twenty years if I'm if I'm fortunate. Thanks so much, Ben. Yes, and I know I've helped some of your students with their research on system justification theory. As full disclosure for everyone, I also work at LIU Brooklyn as a librarian, so I've done some, a little bit of research on that too. So much appreciated, Ben. 
Um, I see that Stina has her hand raised. Um, Stina, would you like to ask Ben a question? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I, I'm not a psychologist, so and I didn't know that authoritarianism was came out of um, psychology. So um, I really appreciate some of the things you were saying, and it got me thinking about the current moment and the way that um, following rules or not following rules is playing out right now. And mm -hmm. um, this is still a thought in formation, so I might babble a little bit, but. Um, you know, you're saying that authoritarianism, especially right-wing authoritarianism, is connected. One of the markers, right, is conventionalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm noticing right now there is the right-wing, people are arguably voting for an authoritarian, right? Um, but this idea of, like, let's not follow the rules if we're being asked to wear a mask, um, you're infringing on our freedom. Um, and then at the same time on the left, there's a lot of this, like, we just need to follow rules right now. Like we need to follow the rules because otherwise we will die in a way that can be troubling to me. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't wear masks, right? But there seems to be this almost, I don't know if authoritarian, like impulse is the right word to use, but um, sometimes a not very critical following of rules um, on that side. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how authoritarianism is playing out in relation to um, sure, thank you, thank you, Stina. That that was a that was an interesting question, and I, I like the way you framed it. I also want to say that that um, that Stina pointed out something that I hope you know. If, if you didn't know this, if, uh, that that I I hope this is at least one of the take home points uh, of today, right, for me, and it has nothing to do with me, right, nothing to do with my own research, but it's this that authoritarianism, right. That that literature, right? That was developed. That started by psychologists, right? That's you know I I, I want to say that because you know there there's a a, a kind of a, a more popular measure, right, of authoritarianism called authoritarian child rearing values. I, if I had more time, I would you know I would talk to you about that. And and it's a very interesting line of work. But I bring that up to say simply that. Um, I have so much respect for political scientists, right? Uh, uh, but but uh, I like to to kind of um, stand up for uh, psychologists and kind of really kind of introducing the phenomenology of a, a of authoritarianism. But then to answer your question, right, about um, you know how is authoritarianism associated with something like rule following, right? Um, I think that's a, a slightly complicated issue because like you said, um, I think that that in our, our, our current president, um, or at least the person, you know, that tends to be in that role, <laughs> I don't know if we want to acknowledge him as actual president or not, but anyway, has, uh, it, it could be a very quintessential authoritarian kind of leader, as, as you said. Right now, uh, uh, and, and then authoritarianism is, is also associated with conventionalism, but also uh, authoritarian submission and authoritarian aggression. Right. And so my thinking, right, um, is that at least on the right, people on the right um, seem to be submitting right to a strong man authoritarian leader in Trump. Right. Uh, in Trump and in other right wing political elites. Right. Whether it's governors, whether it's, you know, Congress people and so forth that are saying, you know, that, that were saying and, and might still continue to be saying that masks aren't as important, right? Whereas on the other side, right, um, you have perhaps, you know, Dr. Fauci, right, who is not authoritarian in any way and is simply telling people to follow specific scientific guidelines, right, uh, uh, who actually has a lot of credibility with, with Americans in general, much more credibility uh, at least in terms of polling, right, than someone like Trump, right? Uh, and so you have a group of people that tend to be primarily on the left, right, that seem to be almost kind of engaging in confrontational behavior in terms of like, wear your mask, right? Um, is that associated with authoritarianism? Um, you know what? I, I might say that it could be associated with authoritarianism, but I don't think it is, in fact, authoritarianism, 
right? Because, you know, authoritarianism ultimately involves, right, uh, going back to my definition, you know, uncritical nationalism, right? And I don't think people on the left have that uncritical nationalism, at least right now, right? But also ethnocentrism, right? Dislike of, you know, uh, outgroups and particularly disadvantaged outgroups, right? And so the people on the left that are saying, wear your mask, right, aren't really directing that towards like lower status or like low power groups, right? Um, it seems kind of um, aggressive, right? To tell somebody to wear a mask on the street, right? Like that is kind of like a slightly conversationally aggressive norm, right? But that is different than, for example, you know, hitting somebody with your car, right? Or, uh, uh, you know, or, or shooting someone, right? And those are the kinds of things that are often associated with authoritarian aggression on the right, right? Uh, now, I, I do want to say that there are also measures of things like uh, left-wing authoritarianism. Some are a little bit older, some are, are, are actually brand new. Um, and that is also uh, a literature that, uh, that I'm engaging and that I'm, I'm frankly kind of critical of. Um, but I would say that you know, I do think there is author some authoritarianism on the left, right? I don't mean to morally make, you know, one political party or group superior to another one, right? That's not what the focus of this talk is, right? Um, but that being said, right, I do think, right, and I, and I believe in what I would say is that research supports the idea, right, that um, authoritarianism is more associated with the, with the right than the left. But that, but I think that was a very interesting question in terms of like what is happening with you know kind of like the the norms of kind of aggressively telling people to wear masks. Thanks. Yeah, that's really helpful. So to think about some of that terminology around like rule following, and on what basis. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stina and Ben. Um, and so next, um, Rachel King has a question, and then after Rachel King, we will, we can move on to David. Um. This is actually kind of piggybacks on what you were and what you were just saying about about the association with authoritarianism and the right. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about like in a sort of in the general discussion, whether it's journalism or in high school classes about um, is there some way that we can better refine like how we talk about the political spectrum and in in a in a way that would be um sort of accessible to people i just say this because um my sister-in-law since we're talking about in-laws and stuff my sister-in-law was just saying to me this week uh that you know she'd always considered herself a moderate and she was talking about how she learned in high school that the political spectrum was more of a horseshoe and that if you get to the ends of the spectrum you wind up with stalin and hitler and the left and the right is totally the same and like i didn't i wanted to respond to her without sounding like i was like throwing around these kinds of ideas and like but it seemed to me like it's very damaging if people who are really like she is actually on the left but doesn't know it. She thinks she's a moderate. And I'm just like wondering, and because of something that she may have heard in high school. And, and so I'm just like wondering how could we maybe quickly shift the conversation in this country so that more people have an understanding of themselves as being more kind of left and not authoritarian and not clinging to this idea of being a, centr a, a centrist just because they don't want to be associated, I don't know, with stuff like it. Um. Thanks, Rachel. I, 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 you know, in my opinion, um, that is one of um, the, you know, the more important questions of the, the early 21st century. And um, that unfortunately, I think my, my rather pessimistic view is that um, I don't think we can quickly make that shift, right? Uh, but what I would say is that one of my like career gripes, right, is about what I call um, both side ideology, right? Both sides, right? Both sides are bad, right? Um, uh, uh, now, now there, there's actually research on this that might call that the, like the ideological extremity hypothesis, right? This idea that it's these people on the ends that are bad or ex the, the extremists, you know, uh, uh, and then, you know, like you said, the more moderates, the horseshoe people in the middle are, are, are better and it's, it's, it's more ideal uh, uh, um, to be in the middle. I think that um, that 
scientists need to abandon um, this kind of um, kind of perceived value neutrality, right? And um, and I think that uh, let me think about this. What I what I what I think is that um, that there is a framing problem that uh, we 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 have. Uh oh. Hello. What's wrong, Ben? Hi, Ben. We can hear Hello? you. Hello. Yeah. You can hear me. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Some uh something just happened. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Um, I think I got like a phone call on my computer. I'm, I apologize. Um. So, oh, so, so I think, I think the problem, right, is that um, people are attracted to this very simplistic narrative, right, that everybody's bad, just be in the middle, right, that there's something important about centering oneself in the middle, right, um, and I think that, uh, I think that scientists need to kind of, social scientists, I should say, need to need to get over that right uh, I wish I had a more sophisticated answer to it um, but but you know unfortunately this is a very like what you're talking about is a, a kind of a very contentious issue in the field right and, and so for example um, I went to New Orleans for the Society of Personality and Social Psychology uh, and was in fact rooming with my colleague Dr. David Caicedo here and, and, and giving a presentation on left-wing authoritarianism, right? And, and there are researchers right now that are trying to suggest that, uh, that left-wing authoritarianism in the United States exists and it could be as big of a problem as right-wing authoritarianism, right? And um, I think that uh, for too long, right, uh, a, you know, what I would call um, serious social scientists did not engage that research and did not take those people seriously, which actually allowed that program of research to flourish, right? And that now what needs to happen, right, is that, you know, you have to confront these people. And so, you know, when I was at this conference, I mean, when obviously when I say confront, I don't, I don't mean, you know, with hostility, right? Um, uh, but you, you, need, you need to let them know, like, like the, the data exists, right? The data, I, in my opinion, the data suggests that authoritarianism is associated with conservatism, right? Uh, and so um, what I will do is if I see somebody talking about left-wing authoritarianism with both ideology, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't explore left-wing authoritarianism, Okay, I do think that, you know, that there is some merit to that inquiry. Okay, um, but if someone is trying to kind of frame left wing authoritarianism as um, uh, um, as as important in the United States as um, as right wing authoritarianism, uh, I can't remember the uh, the song, but there was this song from like the late 80s, early 90s. And the person says, I'll be, wait, uh, something right here waiting for you, whatever it takes, and something heartbreaks. If you, some of the older people here, I can't remember that song. But anyway, the point that I'm making is that if people, you know, make these claims about left-wing authoritarianism, they can expect me uh, 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 and others, not just me, not just me, but uh, uh, committed social scientists uh, to, to engage that problem uh, with the attention that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and Ben. And next up, um, David, would you like to ask Ben a question? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Ben. Hey, David. Um, so I actually want to talk about LWA for a minute, um, sure. since since we're on the since we're on the topic, because um, uh, certainly RWA is is as you said associated with conservatism. There's no doubt about it. The data is there. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I have a question, actually, and I was thinking of you as I was watching the news earlier this week in regards to the uh, what's going on in Portland um, with uh, you know you, uh, Trump sending uh, mm, his troops mm-hmm. over to over to the West mm-hmm. Coast, over to Portland specifically, and there was something that I caught. It was either Monday or Tuesday, where <clears throat> uh, a black armed militia group had actually sort of been present at these protests i think it, i think they're called N, nfac or something mm-hmm. and i was wondering since you were talking about in relation to your i want to bring it back to your particular presentation so if rwa has policy outcomes such as stop and frisk what do you think if you know just your thought what do you think lwa policy outcomes might look like or might be. Mm. Um, mm. And in, in regards to the methodology of LWA, since I think you said it perfectly, RWA is associated with hostility, aggression. LWA, if it exists, cannot be viewed in the same way. So what other, what like in terms of mask wearing and demanding that people mm. wear masks, so what other component might LWA be associated with, if any, if, you know, your thought on, on this, is it emotion? Is it, you know, what, what do you think that that might be? Okay. Um, so I have, I have a couple of different ideas there. And so one is that, um, with respect to left-wing authoritarianism, um, my, my argument is not that it doesn't exist. Um, my, my argument is simply that it is very hard to find in the United States. And I do think that in the United States, we have a rather restricted range of ideology, right? Um, uh, and and, and um, uh, the left, you know, the left half of the political continuum is much more restricted in the United States than it is compared to, for example, Western Europe, right? So, so the United States simply doesn't have the leftists right, for example, that, that, that Europe has, right? Um, and so I imagine that there could be cases, right, internationally, where we would find in this more, in this, this broadened continuum, right, um, uh, that authoritarianism on the left might actually be associated with something like aggression, right? I don't, I, you know, uh, I'm open to that hypothesis, right? I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to find that, right? Uh, but then, you know, to your um, question about what might left-wing authoritarianism predict in the United States? Um, mm, you know, I, I wish, um, you know, like, th- now, you, you have to understand that this also kind of reflects, like, my views on what left-wing authoritarianism is in the United States. I don't know if it would actually predict any any kind of like negative outcomes other than someone being nasty to someone about wearing a mask right like wear you know wear a mask or we won't serve you or 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 something to that effect but you know i don't i don't think that we would see you know aggression violence and so forth in in the united states from people on the left at least right now now um authoritarianism is also associated with threat Right. And so if something were to happen where, you know, COVID-19, you know, mutated into some kind of like black plague kind of, you know, maybe on that level, something could happen. Right. But but uh, even with the with with the uh, uh, increased levels of threat from COVID-19. Right. Which I do think uh, would 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 make our country normally shift slightly more conservative. Right. Uh, I think. (laughs) <laughs> I think we're in an interesting time where um, because of the reaction of, you know, right-wing political elites in this moment, if anything, I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a slightly leftward shift, especially as we're approaching November, right? Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Um, I would say that there is research that suggests that, like, like the um, um, the the research by by Luke Conway, who's a social and uh, political psychologist, 
uh, suggest that left-wing authoritarianism, I think, was, like, associated with support for, um, like, you know, Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election, you know, or something to that effect. So, it, you know, it's associated with things that you would think it would be associated with, but not phenomena that are actually, you know, associated with authoritarianism in, in, in my viewpoint. Um, thank you. Those are great, um, really comprehensive answers to some of these kind of topical questions. Um, and to get even more topical, um, I guess my question was just about kind of the elephants, the orange elephants of the room, um, mm -hmm. is, uh, Donald Trump. Um, I guess I'm wondering, you've talked a lot about different um, definitions of authoritarianism over time. I'm kind of wondering how the specter of Trump sort of has interacted with those, if you've seen any movement to like, um, does he fall into a classic definition? Is he kind of doing his own thing? You know, are people kind of changing um, how they think of these concepts in relation to the orange individual that we all know so well? Yeah, thank you, Elvis. That's a really interesting question. And it's something that, you know, at some point I thought about, but I actually hadn't thought about recently. So let me try to think, think this through. Um, I think, that um, Trump, uh, he, he's, he's, I don't actually think he is the quintessential like authoritarian leader, right? I think that, uh, you know, if you want like, you know, the quintessential authoritarian leader, right-wing authoritarian leader, I mean, people, people will probably say Hitler, right? Um, and, and I think that um, that there's a there's a particular kind of specter that is associated. Now, it, what, what's what's interesting is like people use the word specter oftentimes to think about authoritarianism, like the specter of authoritarianism, right? But I, I almost feel like there's a separate like specter of Trumpism, right? And that you know Trumpism to some degree is about um, kind of a maybe anti-elitism, hmm. you know, perhaps anti-intellectualism to some degree. Um, I think it's about almost, uh, uh, you know, wanting to, to uh, disrupt the system, right, in, in, in a way. And so what's kind of, what's kind of interesting is that with, with respect to, uh, you know, think, thinking about when Trump was elected, not thinking about now, but when Trump was elected, I think, Oftentimes, the people that 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 voted for Trump wanted some kind of system disruption. They wanted to go, you know, to to kind of go back to something that predated Obama. They they oftentimes wanted to e kind of erase kind of <laughs> the you know the 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 eight you know uh, two thousand eight to twenty sixteen, right? Um, so I think that there there is a specter uh, of Trump that. Um, has that is separate from authoritarianism itself um uh that hit that has that has benefited trump to to be honest i think um um i don't and so i i suppose what i'm thinking is that i i think what we might be saying is a blend of kind of authoritarianism and, and, and trumpism Right, I think that's kind of what's happening. So I think we might be seeing like classic authoritarianism and something happening with with people liking the cult of personality around Trump. Uh, Joel, you 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 also mentioned Mussolini would be like a really good example of uh, of like your quintessential um, right wing authoritarian, right? Um, and so like you don't like for so what I would say is like when we're thinking of like quintessential, you know, authoritarians. Like at some point, people are going to be dressed up, maybe wearing berets, maybe maybe in some military fatigue, right? We haven't seen like Trump do that, right? Uh, uh, whereas in some other countries, you know, you will see leaders, right, wearing wearing military fatigues. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think that's. A I hope I hope that answered your question. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I like separating the specter from the individual. I mean, I think that's really interesting. And um, Joel has also made some comments in the chat. I think you know depending on what context you're looking at it from, there's so much of a long shadow of the 20th century into the 21st, um, and that can play out pretty differently. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I think we all could wish we, we would chat um, forever about these topics. This is really great. And thank you so much for being here. Um, we have arrived at 504. I don't know if there's any last questions in the chat that we could take. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again, um, Ben. We really appreciate your time. Thank you everyone for a very lively and active conversation. Um, this was just really an excellent group. And um, yeah, any last words, Ben, for our audience? <laughs> Um, I want to say to all of you, thank you so much um, for attending this talk on a very hot day um, <laughs> at, at the end of July when you could have been at the beach. I was telling Elvis and, and, and Kate that I was literally at the beach like this morning and, and came <laughs> in the Rockaways and came back here. Uh, and so it means a lot to me that both uh, CUNY and the Graduate Graduate Center and, and, uh, invited me to speak as part of the Mina Reese Conversation Series. Uh, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. I also want to say in general that I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how uh, uh, essential the library was uh, in both this investigation and uh, in my research in general, because the library is, in my, in my example, the equalizer, right? And the library is what allows me to confront, you know, uh, uh, the... Kind of my, my, my intellectual adversaries, right? The people that want to talk about both ideology, right? Because I can go to psych info and say, you know what? You are misrepresenting the literature. And I know that because I've read it myself, right? Oh, you're misrepresenting authoritarianism. Do you know why? Because I actually checked the book out of the library and read it, right? Uh, uh, and that is actually one of the things that motivated um, uh, like uh, kind of, the program of research that uh, that I'm into now, which which like I said was kind of inspired by this, and so uh, you know I don't want to get into it now because I know we're at the end, but I will just say that as a tease in case you ever want to have me back, right? Uh, that I would be happy to talk about some of the other work that that, that I'm doing as well. And, and thank you all very much. Um, this was a this was a real pleasure and honor. Thank you so much, Ben. This has been so wonderful to speak with you and to Elvis and to everybody else. Um, and Ben, I will actually send everybody your Google Scholar page so that for everybody who attended who would like to read more about Ben's work, um, you can check out his Google Scholar page um, and a lot of his publications will be listed there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what I would say is that, um, you know, the last for real quick, the last four years, 2016 and now, were very, very busy. I had a daughter. My university, as Kate knows, locked out the faculty for a time, and there were some crazy things. So I say that to say that I haven't been, uh, like, there hasn't been a lot of stuff out yet, but keep looking at this Google Scholar profile because, like, I've been stockpiling data, and I'm, and I'm ready. My daughter's old enough to give me some free time so that I can be at the computer. So I hope to really... Uh, uh, engage his literature and be in the library a little bit more. Thank you again, Ben. I'm really looking forward to reading more of your research. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye for now and see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. You.